Rivian is one of the most exciting EV startups out there following Tesla's model, scaling up and making really compelling cars. They are still in their early stages, shipping two luxury priced vehicles, and they are struggling a bit as they ramp up, most of which is expected, but their products have received incredible reviews. They have clearly gone with this adventure branding, and it shows throughout their R1T and R1S. The R1T was one of the first electric trucks to hit the market, which was incredibly exciting, and soon after, they launched the now very popular R1S. Coming up in about a week, they'll be announcing the R2 vehicle, which should be a smaller version of the R1S, and I'm very excited to see that because it should be cheaper and appeal to many more people. In any case, about a year and a half ago, I took delivery of my Rivian R1T. At the time, the only option available was the large pack quad motor. Today, Rivian's options have drastically changed, and prices have increased, but right out of the gate, this car was extremely impressive. I had a great time with this truck, but ultimately decided it was time to let it go. So today, I'm detailing why I sold my Rivian R1T, and let's get into it. First, let's get into some positive things here. The R1T is an incredibly well-made EV. It takes everything that makes an EV great and does it to the highest standard. Tons of power, instant torque, great handling, great driving dynamic options, air suspension to raise and lower the truck, a very noticeable amount, incredible off-roading capability, lots of versatile storage, and much more. One of my favorite things about this truck was the gear tunnel, the storage under the rear seats, and the powered front trunk. For daily use, the front trunk was a great place to store things. The interior quality is also top notch. I love the design and wood paneling inside, but overall build quality held up super well inside, which is not usually the case with a brand new automaker making their own cars. My one complaint there might come with road and wind noise, since that came in through the windows a bit more than I would have preferred for a car this expensive when on the freeway. Software is up there with the best software-based vehicles, and it better be since they have a software approach. You get software updates throughout ownership, and I saw many great features get added like camp mode, dash cam, access to the truck bed camera, added streaming services, updated driving mode menus, and much more. It's very much like Tesla in that way where you're getting software updates with new features periodically, and it's exciting because your truck is getting better. They can do this since most of your controls for the Rivian are handled on the main center screen. The glass roof is super nice, but then comes the truck bed. This is a great truck bed for its size, and it has room for a full-size spare tire. It even has integrated outlets and an air compressor, but mine came with the powered tonneau cover, which was an upgrade and pretty much broke for every Rivian owner within the first couple weeks of ownership. Soon after, Rivian stopped shipping this feature and talked for almost the entire time I had this car about having an upgraded version coming soon. That finally did come out, but I never heard about actually getting it fixed on my particular truck. That may be because mine still worked about 90% of the time, and I hadn't actively been reaching out to service about it. My issues with it were usually that it didn't quite roll up all the way, or made some terrible sounds when rolling up. Likely, if I had stuck with this car, I could have gotten this replaced by Rivian. Before I get into more issues I had with this truck though, in general, I quickly figured out that I didn't really need a truck. I used the Rivian a few times to move furniture, do large Costco or Ikea pickups and things like that, but the majority of the time my tonneau cover was closed. As someone who is into EVs and efficiency, I very much recognized that while this truck was very cool, I was paying more to operate it when I could easily be driving a smaller vehicle. That vehicle would also be easier to get around in and easier to park. Even the R1S would have made a bit more sense for me in hindsight. So I wasn't using the R1T quite as much as I had originally hoped, and one contributor there was charging. The R1T is an incredible road trip car. It's comfortable, has tons of space and storage, has ventilated seats and more, but after one road trip up and down California in this thing, I was pretty scarred. I ran into broken chargers and very slow ones at almost every stop, and almost got to the point of wondering if I'd need to get a hotel and trickle charge overnight. My battery got very low, but I eventually found a charger that worked properly after about three stops, and that's the reality of third-party charging. It's really tough out there for anyone but Tesla owners, and that was my experience in October of 2022. So I literally never charged this in the wild again, and only ever drove it long enough to come back home and charge at home. Every road trip just made way more sense in my Model Y. With that said, things are changing a bit here. Rivian has expanded their adventure network and continues to do so, and those are much more reliable than third parties like Electrify America. As an owner today, that's probably the best option in places like California, but then coming in spring of this year, Rivian will have access to Tesla superchargers. That's a true game changer and something that would have made me keep this truck if I had needed a truck and had less issues with it. I already mentioned the tonneau cover, but one issue I had early on that eventually was fixed with software was a bunch of bugginess with the built-in map system. It would constantly mess up my positioning and end up recalculating my route. On top of that, directions were super weird. 
Build-wise, I did have a couple of unfortunate alignments and some random loose things around the exterior of the car. The R1T had a couple physical recalls when I owned it, but luckily their mobile service was able to come out and fix them for me at my house. The closest Rivian service center to me is in Costa Mesa, which at the wrong time of day could be about two hours one way, best case scenario about an hour, so I'm glad I didn't have to go in for those. The biggest issue I had though came with some weird notifications on screen, and that did require the truck to be towed to Rivian service. The truck would pop up with error message occasionally saying, vehicle battery issue, service truck soon. This is clearly pointing to the main high voltage battery and is not something you want to see on any EV. Luckily, of course, I was well within warranty. On top of that though, it would say system fault detected, performance limited, service may be required. And I definitely experienced this. When you went pedal to the floor, it was a very slow vehicle. I'd drive somewhere with these errors present. Then when I got back into the car, they were gone. Completely gone too, not in notifications or anything, with no record that they ever popped up, aside from the photos I took on my phone. It felt like I'd get these things when the truck sat in colder weather for a bit, but I can't imagine that's actually the issue. Eventually these were popping up more, so I scheduled Rivian service, but the first available appointment was over three months away, which I personally think is unacceptable for any vehicle. Maybe they have a priority system in place, but for errors like this, three months is extreme and an unfortunate downside of buying a car from a new company. This is something Tesla dealt with for a long time and still does to a degree in certain markets. It's something that happens with new car companies. So I was waiting a few months for the appointments and then suddenly the truck just stopped working for real. The performance was suddenly extremely limited and the top speed it allowed was 13 miles per hour in the middle of a drive. Luckily it didn't happen on a freeway because that would have been a really bad situation. Rivian's service number advised to do a walk away reset where you walk away from the car for about 30 minutes and then come back. Remarkably, this worked, but of course we scheduled service right away. After that reset, the truck said tire pressure monitor not working, service immediately. Something was going on in a big way here and it was frustrating because this needed to end up at the service center, which was far away from me. Due to how extreme that 13 mile per hour issue was though, Rivian towed it to the service center the next day and they fixed it within a couple days, but the fix itself was a little bit frustrating. After a couple days in the service center, Rivian called and said that they fixed a couple other issues I had reported with the car, like panel alignments with the gear tunnel, which wasn't releasing properly when releasing it from the screen. That was good, but when it came to the issue that locked the car to 13 miles per hour, they said, quote, the recent alert on your vehicle is caused by a software corner case, and we communicated issue to respective teams. Rivian will continuously improve the software and send out updates to your vehicle when available. HV fault during time frame stated, no HV warning lights on or issues found after over the air update. It did mention some labor for the HV battery for one hour, so it looks like they did inspect it, but ultimately this was all due to a software bug. The software thought there was an issue, so to be cautious, its software locked the car to 13 miles per hour to prevent damage. Preventing damage is great, but not when there actually isn't an issue. In my last video where I talked about this, I was ultimately a little bit more positive on it. This was a specific rare corner case, and the information they learned from my issue would help ensure all other Rivians on the road do not end up with the same problem. That's great, and roadside assistance helped out, they towed the car into service for free, resolved it in a few days, and then I picked the car back up in Costa Mesa. On the other side of things though, this issue did end up coming back, and it was coming back right before I sold this car. These same two alerts popped up yet again on screen, and I was very frustrated since I was already locked in to sell this car the next day, and Rivian had said that they fixed this non-issue. Luckily, after a walkaway reset again, the issue did not come back, but it could be something that pops up in the future on this car. So that's a part of what you are accepting when buying a Rivian. It's a great car, but when it has an issue, it's not a fun time to get it fixed. It's not a simple drop it off at your local service center. Service centers may be far from you, appointments may be backed up for multiple months, and then for the issue, it might even not be fixed, even if it's reportedly in software. For me, I have a YouTube channel to talk about my real experience owning these cars, but even I was getting a bit annoyed at things, and this really added to it. On the software side of things, the Rivian is overall great, but sometimes there were random bugs there as well. For example, you click into a menu for settings or drive modes, and it takes around five seconds to load. I was also having a really weird issue when I would open up the cameras on screen, and they would entirely freeze when I was driving. Just a lot of soft resets throughout ownership in this car, and then a lot of hard ones as well to try to fix bigger issues that then had to be fixed at service. This may not seem like much, but when you're reliant on the screen and your option or setting is behind a menu, five seconds for things to load like that is a very long time. It sort of makes you wish you just had a physical button. Comparing that to Tesla's software, it's night and day, and that's something I do hope Rivian fixes in software in the near future. It should be able to be fixed for all vehicles in an over-the-air update, but we'll see. 
At the end of the day though, it's not the biggest deal and the good parts of this car do outweigh that. This car was just making less sense for me and I'm more excited about their next Rivian, the R2. The R2 is going to be unveiled in about a week, and it's supposed to be probably exactly what I'm looking for. I personally like the Model Y a lot today due to its practicality, but the R2 is going to be a smaller SUV than the R1S, bringing everything great about Rivian, but it will come in a much cheaper package. The R2 is expected to start as low as $40,000 and be the lower cost, higher volume car that Rivian can scale up to reach the masses. It will also be their second vehicle platform, so they will have learned everything from their first vehicle platform and applied it to this one. Likely it's going to be more of a form factor I'm looking for and much more efficient than I saw with the R1. I'm a drummer, so I do need enough space to load in drums quite often, and I need it to be protected instead of open like a truck bed. One time I actually did use the Rivian for a gig, but it was raining, so I ended up just loading everything into the seats, which was pretty funny. And yes, that's another data point as to why I personally do not need a truck. Speaking of trucks though, once I drove the Cybertruck, my eyes opened a little bit. I understand that this truck is not for everybody and that it's a very specific thing, but I don't think anybody should fully knock it before they drive it. The Cybertruck has steer by wire, and to me that is a huge game changer for vehicles this large. It makes it incredibly easy to maneuver since your full lock is about 170 degrees. You turn that wheel that much for a U-turn, and it makes it far easier to maneuver than any other truck, including the R1T. It's a truck that's even larger than the R1T, but to me, felt smaller and easier to drive and maneuver. I remain impartial on this channel towards all EVs. I try to review them fairly across the board, and then I'm very quickly to point out flaws with any of them, including Tesla's. At the same time, I still do find myself drawn to Tesla products. If I do end up with a truck in the future, I think it very well may be a Cybertruck. In part, it's because it's different, but largely it's Tesla has their own ecosystem, their software, and their charging. It's also just a blast to drive and builds incredibly well, especially from the inside. It also has a six foot bed, so it's a bit more practical for large truckloads than the Rivian's four and a half foot bed. Those aren't arguments for the average customer, but just some reasons why I found myself not needing to keep this R1T. Another issue with the Rivian relates to the efficiency I mentioned earlier. Of course, this car is larger than I personally need, but vampire drain has also been a very prominent issue in these cars. Rivian has tried to work on this with updates, and we've seen some updates here, but I definitely noticed this throughout ownership. If it was a few days where I didn't drive the R1T and I didn't have it plugged in, I'd get back and notice it drained further than I'm used to with a Tesla. In any EV, small amounts of energy will be used when parked due to battery management and other systems like that. If you have the active security camera system running, that obviously uses more energy, and if it needs to charge the low voltage battery, that does as well, but Rivian's drain here is a bit extreme. One owner reported that when they left their car in their garage for two weeks, the R1S lost 20% of its battery. Their Kia EV6 comparatively lost 1%. So just to sit in the garage, the Rivian used 27 kilowatt hours of energy in two weeks. In my city, that would cost around $6.21, or around $3 a week in energy that is just lost. Reportedly, this has massively improved in recent updates, but it factored into my decision since I was experiencing this throughout ownership. I was paying extra to maintain the charge on a car that I wasn't fully utilizing. Then of course there is depreciation. This was an early VIN R1T, and while their prices have gone up, used pricing isn't maintaining quite like it was in the past. If I had held onto this truck that I didn't need for certain driving scenarios like road trips, it would have depreciated even more with time. It just made sense that I had a great time with it and I can move on. So I sold it to CarMax, who actually gave me the best deal I found around, especially after seeing the prices similarly specced R1Ts were going for in my area. The initial excitement of this truck has worn off for the market and they are available to purchase, so it's depreciating like cars normally do. I still am very supportive of the Rivian brand though, and I really can't wait to see them charging at Tesla superchargers. That will be a huge milestone for them later this year, and once the R2 releases and can charge there, I think that will be a big moment for them. It could be a vehicle that gets me to go back to the brand, assuming some of these software things have been ironed out, and they have managed their service center capacity a bit better. Likely it will be some time before they get there though. They're struggling through the toughest part of growing a company and they still lose money for each vehicle they sell. I imagine the true comfort with the brand will come once the R2 scales up, similar to the Model 3 and Y, and they can ramp up investment in service centers and chargers. Overall, I'm sad to see this truck go. I loved it and Rivian makes an incredible product, but it just didn't make sense for me personally anymore. What are your thoughts on the R2 though? Are you excited to see that from Rivian? Leave a comment below to let me know your thoughts. In the meantime, if you wanna see my initial impressions of the new Model 3 that I somewhat replaced this with, you can check out that video linked up here or in the description below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.